So without further ado, we are going to welcome Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie, for coming. Okay. But my background is in basic research. I did um, studies in HIV and CD8 T cell immunology at UNC, and then again here at Duke uh, for my postdoc. About seven years or so ago, I transitioned into a more administrative role. And in that role, I helped to develop grant writing classes. And I also worked as a grant writer, and I worked with several um, students and postdocs that were preparing published applications. So what I'm going to share today is a little bit that I learned from that experience. I'm not going to talk very much about the technical details of applying for the F32. So if you have questions about that, we can talk afterward or I can help direct you to resources in that space. We're going to talk more about strategy. We're going to start very broad and then kind of narrow down with some specific examples of how you can address some um, strategies with writing the F32. So our outline today is to talk a little bit about the purpose of the F32, the challenges and the benefits of applying for one, and then tips for a successful application. Okay, so the purpose of an F32 award. If you ask generally around, what's the purpose of the F32 award? What you'll hear is something like this, to fund my postdoctoral research project. Now, if you look at NIH documents and the funding opportunity announcement for an F32, you'll find something slightly different. You'll find that the purpose of the F32 is to enhance the research training of promising postdoctoral candidates who have the potential to become productive, independent investigators, and more specifically in health-related research fields relevant to the missions of NIH. And that's important not to forget because the NIH decides what's relevant to them. So it's important for you to understand their perspective and what they're going for when you sit down and try to explain to them why you're an important candidate. So what about the application itself? That was the award. The application, what we think about is it's, again, to pay for my postdoctoral research project. But the application itself is to ask for money. I mean, that, that's what an application is for a grant. It's asking for money. And it's asking specifically for an investment not necessarily in your research project, but in you and your career and all the research projects that you're going to do afterward once you develop yourself as an independent investigator and have a, a research program. So you need to be able to explain why you're working in a field that's important to NIH and how the investment in you will benefit them. Okay, so why is it important to think about this perspective? Well, the perspective and how you enter into writing this application influences your negotiation behavior, how you approach the discussion that you have on paper, because that's all you get to do. You don't get to go into a room and have a conversation with people making decisions about whether or not to fund you. You have to explain it all on paper to an objective audience. Okay, so negotiation behavior models. If you enter into this endeavor with the idea that the F32 is to fund your research project. You use something that I like to call the toddler model <laughs> negotiation. So the toddler model is something along the lines of, I see that you have candy, and I would like to have that candy, and I'm a very deserving person. So in that, you've really just got a couple of players. You've got yourself, you've got the sponsor, which will be NIH, and you've got the candy. And so those are the only things you're going to talk about, right? If you go and think a little bit more about what the F32 is about, you might be able to get a little more sophisticated and employ the kindergarten model. <laughs> okay, so now you're saying, hey, I like candy, and I am a good person, and you have candy, and if you give it to me, I'm going to be nice to you. So now you got a little bit more there. So you've got me and you, the sponsor, you've got the candy, <coughs> analogy here is the research funding, and you've got some sort of vague positive outcome for the sponsor. So you might be talking about the research that you're doing and how it's going to have this public health benefit, but you're not super specific about what that is. So what I'd like to get to today is the third grader model. So here you're saying, listen, 
candy gives you energy. And I see that you have some of that. And you've been asking me for a long time to clean my room. And if I had more energy, hence the candy, I could do that for you. So you've got yourself, you've got the sponsor, you've got the candy, but you've got the rationale for why you need that in order to have a very specific deliverable outcome that you know the sponsor wants. And that's what we want to achieve in this application. So, what are the challenges? Okay, they're, they're on the decline. A little bit stable, but still kind of heading down low. So what we're looking for here are the, uh, the darker blue are the federal fellowships. And that's kind of where the F32 sit. A little bit stable, but not very much, and slightly on the decline. <coughs> they're highly competitive. And you can see here that the success rate has been hovering in that 26, 27% for a long time. So you're, you're putting something on paper that you're sending out to be evaluated, along with a lot of your colleagues who are also really good investigators and got really good mentors. So how do you set yourself apart from this crowd? Or why do you bother? Okay, so it's an added value. If you go into this based on an assumption, and if the assumption isn't true, then probably that F32 isn't right for you. So the assumption is that you plan to establish an independent research career. And also that that independent research career is somewhere in the realm of public health. That doesn't mean it can't be basic science. Basic science can definitely be in the realm of public health. You do have to explain and make those connections for your audience. It just means that if you're doing something very, very abstract and you can't yourself make that connection, then it's probably not going to, to go over very well with your, your audience. So think about that. Um, and the F32 is a financial investment in your future productivity. So if the assumption is that you're going to be an independent researcher in a public health field and that the F32 will be a financial investment in you, once that investment is made and they see the value in this career, if you make reasonable progress, then you're more likely to be successful in applying for follow-on funding. So that's kind of what you want to think about when you're deciding if the F32 is right for you. And this is a little bit of older data, but data that backs up that statement. So if you look at postdoctoral fellows in general, about 28.6 of those apply for independent research funding within 10 years. Um, and only about 16.9% receive that. If you look at former F32 scholars, 45.5% apply and 30.6% get those experience. So again, it's added value. So what are some tips for success? You want to improve your odds. Again, it's very competitive and the pool that you're going into has a lot of really great researchers. So, you want to understand your funding mechanism first and foremost. And we talked a little bit about that earlier on, but let's dive a little deeper. An F32 is not primarily about your research project. A research project is very important, as is the status of your mentor or mentors if you have a team. But it's really about you, okay? So you need to think about what are my primary deliverables, and how am I going to talk about those? How do the proposed activities prepare you for an important career? How do the proposed research project promote the NIH and the specific center that you're interested in, their goals? And then how does your career goal fill in a necessary investigator niche? So if you're really training up to be just like your mentor, that's a little bit uh, less enticing than if you're adding skill sets that we haven't seen before, that's more likely to allow you to make um, strides in fields that haven't been able to be made before. There are a lot of parts in this application. So this is probably the most technical that we'll get into here. Um, there are a lot of pages, a lot of pieces, a lot of parts. You can look this up if you just look for NIH table of page limits. They update it regularly. You can see uh, the different pieces. But there's a strategy to how you approach writing them. So I recommend for an F32 that the first thing you sit down and write are your background and goals for fellowship training. 
So think clearly about that investment in your future productivity in your career. And start there. So what do you want your independent research program to look like? What kind of an investigator do you want to be? And then step backwards. From there, what do you need to learn in order to get there? How will your research project and your training activities help you to meet those goals? So start with that section. Write your specific aims second. So once you really are clearly um, firm with your career goals, then you can write your specific aims. And in, in a research grant, we usually advise to write the aims first. The reason this is different is because you want to tailor the language and your specific aims to address your career goals. And that's easier to do if you already have written your career goals. Research strategy and write curve. <coughs> And then some other sections just to be aware of. Respective contribu contributions refers to who's doing what between yourself and your mentor or your mentoring team. Um, training and responsible conduct of research is simple but important. And people can get dinged on this pretty easily and often do. They ask you to address five specific questions. Just address those five questions and make sure you address all of them. That's all there is to it. Sponsor and co-sponsor statements are completed by your mentor, but it can be useful, depending on who your mentor is, to provide them a draft. It's also very useful to request this early so that you can look at it and modify it so that it matches what you've said your career goals are. Another very important thing to do very early in the writing process is to read your funding opportunity announcement. This sounds pretty straightforward, but once you start reading through it, you see why people often don't. Um, the F-32s is not bad. It's, it's a handful of pages. It's not terrible. But some uh, parent announcements can go on and on and on for a lot of pages. Read it all the way through, because it tells you specifically what they're looking for. Especially, you make sure you're looking at the current one, because sometimes their primary goals change a little bit. And it tells you exactly how they're going to evaluate you. So if you look at the current F-32 parent announcement, these are the things that they are particularly interested in. They want to know that you're going to receive a strong technical foundation at the end of the award. You will gain skills in research conceptualization. You'll have at least a few um, first author publications. You'll have community interaction transition toward independence and research relevance in your field. By paying attention to specifically what they're asking for, you can explicitly address each of these points. And I would suggest using exactly these words. So write in there and say, here is my, my plan, and at the end of it, this is my publication plan. And how many publications? You can't say specifically what their titles will be or exactly what you're going to learn. But you can at least map out a plan for when you think you'll have deliverables worth publishing, how you're going to have community interaction, so going to conferences, um, being parts of committees, those kinds of things. Speak to these points explicitly. Once you understand your funding um, mechanism, you need to understand your audience. Because the, the audience that's reading this application are your advocates. So, the way that they are reviewed, F-32s are reviewed by the NIH Scientific Review Group, and there's a recurring special emphasis panel specifically for addressing F-32s. Talk a little bit more about that later on. Each person on that panel will receive several applications to review as a primary reviewer. So they're going to be reading anywhere between 6 and 10 applications for which they are primarily responsible. Once they get in the room with their peers, and again, they are in a room with their peers, so it's a very risk-averse situation because they have a reputation themselves to uphold. It's very difficult in that scenario to go out on a limb and say, you know, I hear what you all are saying in, in, in an area of dissent, but I really think we need to fund this person. So think about kind of what they're dealing with. They're going to have a lot to read through, a lot to digest. They have to explain it to the whole rest of this room, room, and then they have to be able to advocate for you and make it as easy on them as possible. So how do we do this? First, know who they are. You can't know who 
will be your primary or secondary reviewer. But you can know what the entire um, roster of the study section is, who, what they look like. So people will rotate off of it. You won't know that it's exactly those same people. A lot of them will be the same, but you'll know the breadth. And for F32s, you'll have a little bit more breadth than you might have for um, like an R01 or an R21. So keep that in mind. Take a look and see, and they, they have these available. Look and see, or do you have MDs on the panel, PhDs on the panel? What kinds of research do they do? What kinds of school do they come from? And you want to make sure that you speak to a common ground so that the person most different from you in that audience can still understand what you're trying to tell them. Understand the review criteria. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. One, the funding opportunity announcement will give you an overview of the research uh, or of the review criteria. You can also find on the Center for Scientific Review website a digest of each of the different mechanisms and the actual templates that the reviewers use to review your application. Look at those, understand what they are asked to evaluate, and again, speak very explicitly towards those points. For F32s, they're going to critique you as an applicant. What they're looking for is, are you in a good situation as far as what you already know to be able to carry out the research activities that you're proposing to do? Do you have the training that you need in order not only to do that research, but also to go to on to the training activities that you're proposing to do? No big gaps between those. Your sponsors, so in this case that would be your mentors, your mentor group, or your primary mentor. Do they have a lot of experience? So if you have an F32 mentor that is a, a newer faculty member and does not have a lot of experience being a mentor, you're not going to be successful. There's a strategy to get around that, and that's to have a more senior person as your primary mentor and a co-mentor with someone who's newer. Because we all know that just career stage and experience doesn't necessarily mean that someone is actually a better mentor than another person. So that junior person may be actually the very best mentor for you, but it won't be successful to put them on an application unless you have a more experienced person co-mentoring with them. So that's a conversation that you may need to have with your um, PI if you're in that scenario. Research training plan. <clears throat> so this is where you're talking about the research that you're doing and any additional research training that you're going to need to get. Make sure that they match. So don't propose that you're going to get trained in research techniques that are just of interest to you but aren't directly relevant to the project that you're proposing in a career path you're proposing. Fine to do that stuff, but you don't need to put it in your application. They want to see that everything connects together and tells one holistic story. Your training potential. And this comes a little bit back to your background again. Are you already situated to be able to capitalize on the training that you're going to be taking? You know, if you say you're going to take some high-level statistics course, but you really haven't had the background in it, even though it may be important for your research project, it doesn't sound feasible. So think about those things as well. And finally, institutional environment and commitments. So you're at Duke. So this was kind of an easy sell for the most part. Um, most reviewers, most places will recognize that Duke has a lot of really great resources that you can take advantage of. What you want to think about here is how you highlight those resources that are particularly valuable to you and to your project. For example, I think we now have something like 70 shared resources and cores. And it's great to say in, in a sentence that we have 70 shared resources and cores. It's not at all useful to you to waste the space to talk about each and every one of those. So what you want to do is pick the two or three that are particularly relevant to you and your project and really highlight those and get uh, letters from the people that run those. Have your mentors mention the resources that you'll be using and the environment that you have. And don't forget that environment is more than just space and stuff. There's the intellectual environment as well. So being able to say that you have expertise in X, Y, and Z down the hall from you, that's worth the space. You 
walk down the hall and get feedback on the different aspects of your research project. The other important aspect to know about your audience is the center itself. So you can put in your cover letter a recommendation for what center you think would be likely to fund your F32. And in that, you're going to want to talk about how your research meets, helps them to meet their goals, how their investment in you as a, an investigator will help them meet the goals that they set for themselves. In order to do that, you have to know what those goals are. So one of the things that I recommend doing early on is to look at the NIH centers and institutes that are relevant to your research field they'll all publish a mission statement. So you have the broad NIH mission statement, but each center and institute has their own mission as well. Find out what they say they're interested in, what they're interested in supporting, um, and what their overall objectives are, and speak to those points. Another really useful thing that you can do once your AIMS page is developed is you can contact the program officer or the training contact for the F32 and talk to them about your research. Find out if it really is fitting within their goals. Um, sometimes they have insider information about the specific priority areas in their center institute for the year, and they can let you know, you know, if you, if you had a little bit more in this area, it might be more competitive, or worst case scenario, hey, we're not really interested in epi studies this year. You know, then you know whether or not you're really using your time to your advantage and putting that the application together. The last thing that you really want to think about is how to engage that reviewer, that primary reviewer, as your advocate. And again, it's, it's a tricky situation for them as well. Um, most of them will do a really, really good job of sitting down and reading carefully through your application no matter what it looks like. It could be word border to border, top to bottom of every single page, exhausting to read, and they are going to do their very best to understand what it is you're trying to do and why. That being said, they will probably take an application that looks like that and put it on the bottom of their stack. So they're going to read the easier ones first, the easier ones for them to, to see and digest first, and they'll get to the ones that look exhausting towards the bottom. And by then, you know, the mental space is a little bit more constrained. So what can you do? <clears throat> Remember what you're being asked to critique and make that info as easy to find as you can. So use the same words. If they're looking at you as a candidate and they're looking for a technical foundation, then say explicitly, this plan will increase my technical foundation by training me in X, Y, and Z. Identify the gaps in your training and how you're going to fill them and be very direct so that when they're sitting in that room and somebody asks them a question, like, well, why are they taking that course? Or why are they wasting their time on this? They can look into the application and find that information very easily and advocate for you in that way. Understand their knowledge base and lead into detail from common ground. One thing that you can do that's really helpful is avoid jargon. So a lot, I don't know, how, how many of you guys work in basic science fields or what you would consider? about three quarters of you. It's really easy to fall into jargon in those fields. Um, be careful about that. Even if you follow the rule where the first time you spell it out and you abbreviate it ever after, if you've got 12 things that you're abbreviating ever after, that's really hard for a reviewer, especially if they're kind of on the outskirts of your field to understand. We had a good example from a K applicant in one of the workshops that I ran that was talking through his aims. And he kept talking about WT. He had WT throughout. You know, most of us that were kind of raised in basic science, we think wild type, right? But every time we saw it, even though we knew that he was not working in that area at all, he was working with Wilms tumor. <laughs> but, you know, and, and it's not that we're dumb or that we can't understand as reviewers where he's going with that, but every time it interrupts your thought process, start over again. So keep that in mind as well. And just you know your space is better used if you just say the words that you mean. And use abbreviations actually to your advantage. So if you have one protein that is 
the key thing that you're looking at. Abbreviate that and nothing else. And then it stands out. Don't require them to infer anything. Because they may and are likely to infer incorrectly. So a lot of the times where we see problems here is in that sort of background section where you're talking about all the research that has been done in your field to date. People tend to think of that as almost a lit review, and they go through everything, everything. That's really easy for an, uh, a reviewer to latch onto something and say, okay, I see where they're going with this. And if you're not going where they see that you're going, either they're going to be frustrated because they went off in this other direction, or they may be disappointed if they were particularly excited about where they thought you were going, when otherwise that wouldn't happen. So make sure that you're leading them um, pretty much by the nose through your rationale. And put everything in the context of your overall plan. That means you're going to have some redundancy. And that's okay, because each section, that redundancy will have a different context. So you're going to talk about yourself as a candidate, obviously in the candidate section, but also in the research plan. You're going to talk about the research that you're doing in the research plan, but also when you're talking about your career goals. And that's fine. The specific aims page is your first chance to really sell your product, if you will, to your viewer audience. And this is where you're going to concisely explain all the compelling aspects of your plan. You want to be specific, but not detailed. That's kind of a hard balance to find. Think of it kind of like a brochure that's going to entice the reviewer to read the rest of the application. So, you know, it's a brochure for Vegas. We've got food and shows and gambling and anything else you might want. Okay, it's not, it's telling you the specifics, but it's not telling you the details. If I want to know, you know, where the hotels are, how much dinner is going to cost me, I read through the rest of the application. So your aims page is your brochure, but it's got to tell all of the specific but not detailed aspects of your application. So it's going to touch on you, it's going to touch on your research, it's going to touch on your mentors. It's going to focus mostly on the research, the research aims and the research plan, but you want to save at least a couple of sentences for your mentoring team and for your sponsors. And you're going to have to have a place that talks about you as a candidate and your overall objectives and your short-term objectives. Practice thoughtfulness. So sit down. Make some lists. Think about where you are and the resources that are available to you. Go through your web pages, write things down, um, and craft a forward thinking plan from there. Most of your application will be forward thinking. Very little of it will be past tense. Keep that in mind. Write positively. Easier said than done, so we'll go through a couple of examples. And leave baggage behind. You want to highlight your strengths and turn weaknesses into opportunities, identify and express your motivation and passion. This can be very important too, because as scientific writers, we're taught to write fairly dryly and not to put a whole lot of emphasis or excitement, no creative writing in there. Um, this is a little bit different because you want the reviewer to connect with you as a person and see you as a valuable in investment. So you're going to talk a little bit about why your research area is important to you. You can have very brief anecdotes in there if they're particularly compelling. Um, and you need to engage your mentor in this process. I know a lot of us tend to think, okay, I'm going to write it all and then I'm going to hand it to them and they're you know, going to check it off. You're going to have to kind of poke at them and push at them and, and make them contribute as much as possible. Um, and do it by pestering. Send them stuff, ask for specific feedback, send them stuff again, because if you end up with an application that doesn't mirror what they can deliver or what their statements say, um, or just seem off target, they don't have the input from the, the research mentor, the reviewers will notice that. So whatever you can, pull them along. Okay, so writing positively. So we talk a lot in these talks about how writing positively, you know, staying in front of the game, turning strengths, you know, weaknesses into strengths, etc. How do we do that? It's 
So here's an example. We've got Frank. Frank's in the first year of the second postdoc. He, his first postdoc was about um, biochemical dissection of apoptotic pathways in breast cancer. His second was in treatment resistance in ovarian cancer. His future career, where he really wants to go, is on understanding molecular underpinnings of chemotherapy resistance and the influence of host and the influence of host genetics. So he's looking at that host interaction there. Um, and he, if he tries to think about how he's going to put this on paper, he appears disorganized, kind of uncertain. And why is this? Because this is how he sees his life, right? Most of us operate on opportunity to opportunity, kind of happenstance. We don't think of this clearly crafted path, even though that's what we have to express on paper. So his reality, as he perceives it, is that he took a long time to graduate. Um, his first postdoc was at a foreign institution and it didn't have a lot of name power. So he loved his first postdoc though, as far as the research goes and as far as his mentor goes. But he got married and he had to move. And that happens. So he picked up a second postdoc because he wasn't quite prepared for a faculty job yet. Um, in his second postdoc, he made some really neat novel observations, but he really enjoyed his first postdoc more and the work that he did. So that's where his connection is. And his current school has a really strong genetics program. So he finds this fascinating and he's thinking about, well, how can he capitalize on the strengths of the school and his interests? And when he thinks about all that stuff, it's just mush. How, how do I talk about this in a way that's meaningful? The important thing to do in your mind is separate out the constraints from the decisions. We all have constraints in our lives that influence what we can and cannot do. Those constraints, the reviewers couldn't care less about. So the fact that he got married and had to move, reviewers don't care. What they care about is the decisions that he made within those constraints. So he could have gone, at that point, to a number of different labs, but he didn't. He chose one specifically. Why did he choose that one? That's the story he's got to tell. So here's how he can talk about his life in a way that's more compelling. His fifth year of graduate school, he was on the brink of an important discovery, and he stayed to finish this out. Okay, so maybe he had kind of a long trajectory. Nowadays, it's really not that long. Um, but he landed a high-impact publication, or he got to present it as an abstract, or he wrote up a methods SOP that was then shared with a lot of different labs. There's a deliverable outcome there that you describe, and so now that's describing his commitment, okay? So during graduate school, he had the opportunity to attend a conference and he met this eminent cancer researcher. The fact that, that cancer researcher is at an institution with low name power is not important in this story. The story is that he met someone that caused him to feel passionately about this research field. And that's the story he's going to tell. So he decided that's where he was going to go and that conveys a decision. Okay. Emerging data pointed to a link between the molecular pathways he had been studying in breast cancer and treatment resistance in ovarian cancer. So now he's thinking about that connection between his first postdoc that he loved and the second postdoc that he ended up with. Okay, and so he felt it would add critical value to his research to move to this new lab. The fact that he was constrained and had to physically move geographically doesn't matter. He decided to move to this lab because it made sense from a research perspective, and that conveys planning. And then he's got this novel observation that suggests a link between a mutation and the development of resistance. And he also is at an institution that has a really strong genetics program, and he's in a lab that has a really strong treatment resistance program, and he's got a background in molecular pathways. He can add these things together and talk about how moving in this direction that's new to him is a value-added career choice because there's not a lot of folks working in that particular area. Same story, same life, but it's told differently and the reviewers will come away with a completely different perception of this person's ability um, to carry on their research. So another example is publication history. Sometimes we have gaps or we have other problems. Um, we have to address those because the reviewers are going to notice them, they're not going to ignore them. But we don't want to do it in a way that sounds like an excuse. So what you really need to do is think about what caused any publication lapses and if there are any positives to come 
out of it. For example, if you were working on protocols and that took a long time to develop and you thought you would get a nice methods paper out of it or you thought it would contribute to a paper earlier and it just took forever to get this out, that could be a big gap, but it might lead to a tool that now a lot of people can use that's really valuable that led to your ability to have a higher impact on the tool you would have had. Think about that and kind of talk about the context of what you were able to produce even in the absence of publications. Because we all know that's the metric that they easily look at, but it's not necessarily the only metric for success. Lead your reader step by step to the right conclusion. So don't assume that the readers are going to be able to see where you are going. And we're so invested in our field that it's very easy to think, okay, this everybody knows the story. Everybody already knows where the field sits and what's novel about what I'm doing. That's just not true. So you be explicit about where the field currently is, what's innovative and new about what you're doing, what the gaps are in between the field and where you want to go and how you're going to get there. And lead them step by step. One of our mentors had an analogy that I think is kind of fun to think about. He said, writing a grant is like leading a blindfolded person through a house. You, know, you can't just grab them by the hand and race. They're going to stumble or fall or hurt themselves. What you have to do is say, you know what? In five steps, we're coming to a doorway. Okay, now here we are at the doorway. So you prepare them. You say, my research is going to address five key aspects in this field. Okay, here are the key aspects, X, Y, Z, etc. Coming to a doorway, I'm going to turn right, and there's a staircase there. And there are five steps. Here we are, step one, step two, step three. So use the space to really carefully funnel down from a broader concept specifically to where you want to go. Use visuals and space to your advantage. If you can, leave some kind of table or visual on every page. You can't always do it, but if you can, break up the monotony of reading a bunch of words, sort of lightens the heart looking at it so you don't get exhausted just looking at a page full of words. Um, but be judicious about it. Obviously, if it's going to take more space to put in a figure than it would be to say it in words, you don't want to do that. This one, I love this example, although I would say for me it's too busy, but the idea behind it is lovely. So what they've done with this example is they've said, okay, here are my scientific objectives, and here is exactly how they map to my career objectives. So you can see, here's what I already know how to do, here's what I'm going to train to do, and how it will inform AIM 2 and AIM 3. And then they also map it to the actual research process as well. So something like that can be really advantageous because it takes a lot more time and space to describe that. I would just recommend a little simple. You're going to want to have a timeline, a simple timeline, and I think this is a very nice example of a timeline. Not too much detail. Don't forget, though, to include training activities and career development activities. So on the timeline, you're going to include any anticipated publications. Um, you're going to include when you're preparing for your next award, when you're preparing to move to the next stage of your career. All, the whole thread of this is going to tell a story of transitioning to independence or to the next level of independence. A couple other examples here is a conceptual model demonstrating how the aims fit together can be helpful. Um, this one at the, the bottom, the before training and after training, I love because that came from a statistician friend and it just felt so suitable for them in their field. Um, and what he was describing was okay, this is where his expertise and his experience will lie before he gets the award. And K awards in this context are similar to F32. They're both training and development awards. And then his well, then diagram shows exactly where he's going to be after the training is done. So you see that he's going to have some exposure in all of these aspects, a lot more expertise and a lot more experience. Final tips, start early. We recommend four to six months, but that's usually not possible. But start as early as you can, at least for the conceptual finish phase. Some folks, especially more experienced investigators, will say, I can write a grant in two weeks. 
And maybe they can, but they're discounting the thought process that we've been talking about because they're doing it all the time. You'll want to actually set aside an account for that time. Um, plan to revise a lot of times. This is not going to be something that you can just dedicate your time to write and be ready to submit. You're going to have to write it, send it away to someone else, let them look at it, give feedback, put it in a drawer for a few days because you'll be so mentally exhausted having written it that you can't effectively revise the craft. It's going to take a lot of iterations. Follow the very simplest formatting guidelines that you can. Don't get fancy. It's not going to impress anybody if you're using serifs or a funny font or you know anything. So simple is what they're looking for. Read your FOA top to bottom. Use headers to your advantage. And this is my very favorite trick. Think of newspapers. This is an illustration of that. So this is actually an illustration from a K award, but this applies to absolutely any kind of grant you might ever want to write. It's a funneling technique that also allows that your primary reviewer to find information very quickly and to understand exactly where you're going. So the first paragraph here is the clinical importance of fibrosis and lung disease. And in this paragraph, you're going to learn the big context. So prevalence, uh, morbidity, mortality, how big is the problem, how bad is the problem. And then this is limiting our ability to effectively treat this illness. Okay, so at the end of that, we know, okay, that's where we're going next. Critical role of macrophages in the injury and repair. Okay, so now I know just by reading your headers, the main context and then a little bit about where you're going. And I expect you better be working with macrophages in the rest of your proposal, or you know, this has been a red herring and led me in the wrong direction. This goes on and on for about two more paragraphs to funnel down even more precisely to their specific piece of the pie, and it can be very effective. Um, make each section reasonably stand alone, and again, this means you're going to have a little bit of redundancy because every section needs to tell the whole story of who you are and why they should fund you. Um, leave out unnecessary information. So if there's a bit of background that doesn't directly relate to the significance of your work, don't include it. Unless you know for certain that that person is on the review panel, in which case you might want to find a way to tie it in. Um, and that, that leads to another point I didn't put specifically on here. We have to identify the gap, the research gap, the limitations of where we currently stand. Do this carefully, because it's easy to say, well, no one's ever looked at, or the field has failed, or there's a paucity of evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Keep in mind that you'll have people on your panel that have worked in this field for a number of years. So rather than really highlighting the failures of where the field is now, talk about the limitations and that you, because of where you are and the, the resources you have available to you and your own ideas, are going to build on the strong foundation that already exists. So there is a gap, but it's not a failing. It's just we haven't got there yet, and we're building on top of that. Ask as many people to read it as possible. If you can, towards the end, give it to somebody that is not in science at all, and tell them specifically, read this for grammar. You won't be able to by that point. You can have the word the in there five times in a row, and you won't see it. So give it to somebody else, not in your field, to look for those kinds of things. And then finally, you have to submit. We can get caught up in the cycle of perfectionism. If you don't ever actually hit the submit button, then you can't get the funding. So, oh, are there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the NIH is starting to move they're recognizing there's more than just academic PI, and, and they're starting to embrace that a little bit, but I feel like reviewers maybe are not recognizing that as well, so would you recommend still writing it with the sign that you're going to be an academic PI? Because it's, For an you don't do, I would. Okay. Yeah, because even though, like you said, NIH has a, has a lot of emphasis now on, what do we call it, alternative career paths? Career right? beyond academia. Career beyond academia. Um, this mechanism is specifically currently about training people to be independent researchers in academia. Okay. So I think that you would have a hard time if you were very blatant about wanting to go off in a different way. A 
that doesn't mean you wouldn't be supported if that's what happened and where, where you wanted to go, but I wouldn't be too obvious about it. There's no eligibility, and there are a number of years post PhD that you're allowed to apply for this type of grant. That's a good question because some of these mechanisms have changed. Um, what I was able to find was not specific, a specific limitation. What I found was that applicants are encouraged to apply as early as is feasible in their postdoc experience where they would still be able to take a full advantage of the three years allowed. I didn't find anything that gave a specific cutoff. Now, the K99s are different. I don't know if anybody's interested in those, but they have now a very firm deadline of four years post-graduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, along those lines, I had an eligibility question, too. Uh -huh. And the um, PO was really helpful. Talk to them, um, the PO. If you talk to the that if you go to the funding opportunity announcement there's online there's a link to a table of, of IC specific contacts and information and that's where you can find the, um, the folks to talk to in your field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I maybe backing off of what he asked let's say so um, taking advantage of the three full years so I have a T32 thinking about applying for an F32, is there, I guess, an advantage or a disadvantage to only trying to apply for one year as opposed to trying to have three full years? So you can have a maximum of, I think it's five years unless you're in a joint degree program, in which case you can have a total of six years of NRSA funding. So you would want to look carefully, and again, I always recommend talking to the POs to make sure that you're within your eligibility bounds. Mm -hmm. I would say apply for what makes sense for your research and training program and make sure that it's within the bounds of what you're allowed. I don't think you'll have the benefit of specifically limiting to yourself to a year unless it's a necessary limitation. So reviewers won't look at that and say, oh, well, you know, she's being kind to us and just asking for a year after having had a break. Okay. So one of the things you mentioned was how are selling that you're, you're filling an investigator niche? And so I'm curious, so for instance, if you write to them, because the NIH has a, a diversity drive in their mission statement as well, mm -hmm. can you say something like, you know, I, I recognize I'm not the only black cancer study pancreatic cancer, but I am the only Mexican lesbian black cats who studies pancreatic cancer. And when I go to conferences, it's all you know white men. And so I fill this niche because I'm diversifying the field. Is that something you can also point out as a niche that you're filling? Is it really only about? I would have that as separate conversations. Uh -huh. So I, I think you need to talk about the research niche in, in and of itself. So if you're studying pancreatic cancer, what is it specifically that you are interested in that is distinct from the rest of the field or is going to take the next step. So that's one conversation. The diversity conversation is definitely worth talking about, but you talk about it slightly differently in a different place. At least that's what I would recommend. So a great place to think about having that conversation is in your personal statement for your biosketch. And I would add to that some, some additional specifics. So in your experience, how would that experience how has it impacted your research decisions, and how would it be a benefit to the research field going on? So yes, I think it's definitely worthwhile that I would have that in kind of two separate bits. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned K99. <coughs> um, so if you're interested in doing K99 eventually, and you also mentioned that the uh, NIH imposes a stricter uh, deadline, a year post, PhD deadline for it? Yeah. Does it at some point make sense to stop investing time on F32 applications and just focus on K99 if that's the case? Or I, it's very person specific, but I would say generally yes, there is a certain point where you, where it's either or you really have to decide which direction you want to go in. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the four year cutoff is for the first 
application, or for, for all applications, I should say. So if you get your K99 in before your four years, and then you need to resubmit, but it's outside of your four years, you're out of luck, unless they've changed that since last year. Um, so I would say about mm, three years in is probably when you really want to start thinking about a K99 instead. 